Hey gang, I got an offer for you today from LinkedIn. As business-to-business marketers, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. On LinkedIn, you have direct access to build relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives, 10 million are C-level executives. You will also be able to drive results with targeting and measuring with their tools built specifically for B2B. And best of all, they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn ads also rank number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of the Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Make B2B marketing everything you can be and get $100 credit. It's $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. It's linkedin.com slash MPN. P-N. Terms and conditions apply. Entrepreneurs Enigma is a podcast for the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. So the wins and the fails that we all face being entrepreneurs and how we learn from adversity. Every week I talk to a different entrepreneur with a story to tell. I'm Seth Goldstein. Come with me on the journey. This is Entrepreneurs Enigma. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Entrepreneurs Enigma podcast. Today, I'm, I'm with Obi-Wan Kenobi here of podcasting. I am here with the famous Joe Casabona, Mr. Jolly himself. How's it going, Joe? I'm doing very well, Seth. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the kind words. And thanks for calling me Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's my favorite Star Wars character. Oh, he's so. awesome. Ben yeah. Kenobi. Good old Ben. Good old Ben Kenobi. Took one for the team. Yeah, rather, absolutely. rather quickly, if you think about it. And I, he, I, I rewatched it with my son. I'm like, he died pretty fast. And yeah. He you pops know, with, in from now and, now and then. Yeah. With, with, the, with the distance of the prequels, we really got to know him. But for people who saw Star Wars in 1977, they, like, um, they met him and then he was just gone. Right? Yeah, like, exactly. And they do all the yeah. remasters yeah. where they brought him his image back in because I think the actor was already dead at that point. Yeah. Or was old yeah. and this aged out yeah. the role. Anyhow, yeah. it's not a Star Wars chat, even this is fun. Joe is a good friend of mine. He is very big in the WordPress ecosystem. He is a teacher, a course creator, a web designer developer, a university professor at one point in his past life, a father, a husband. And that's, you know, and you are one of the quintessential entrepreneurs that I've known because you just go for it. And I love that about you. So how did it all start? I mean, how did it all start? Well, you were born in New York City. (laughs) So honestly, I've kind of always tried to figure out how to make money for myself. I like to describe myself as a uh, shorter, plumper, more realistic Zach Morris because I was always kind of scheming so like we would have yard sales and i would try to sell my used stuff at like a profit um and then in in high school i started fixing people's computers for money i started selling mix cds i was probably making like a couple hundred bucks a week at some at some points definitely a month um selling mix cds for people because we had a dedicated now this is back in the day for all your younger listeners right we used to have to connect to the internet with our phone line. But we had a dedicated phone line for our internet. And so I would just leave the computer on all night, download songs. My friends would give me lists and five bucks. I would guarantee two-day delivery. I was Amazon Prime before Amazon. Oh, um, there you go. And I would burn the CDs in the morning, and I would bring them in a in a bag to school, and I would give them out. And uh, so that was a lot of fun. And then, like we learned that that's illegal that you're not supposed to do that yeah the naps we're the napster generation yeah yeah that's exactly right and um and then i got into making websites so i've always kind of had what people will call the entrepreneurial spirit right i've always tried Mm -hmm. to make my own money i always i you know i i i had jobs from the time i was 12 um like you know sweeping hair in a barber shop 
I ha- I've had all the stereotypical. Don't knock it because you could yeah. you could have become a barber for all you know. Yeah, actually, I did cut my friend's hair in college because the barber shop was closed and he needed a a haircut that night. How did it go? Really shockingly well. He's like Casabona, you're Italian. Cut my hair. Uh, oh jeez. And I was like, dude, I've no never stereotype there. I know. I was like, dude, I've never cut hair before. He goes, I trust you. And we go to this event. It was like we wore suit, you know, suits. Uh, and he got a ton of compliments. And he's like, Eric, your hair looks good. Where did you get your hair cut? And he's like, Joey cut it. And I'm like, great. So, yeah, I could have been cutting hair in the dorm rooms, right? Um, wow. But I, I've, I've always kind of figured out uh, how to, to make money on my own. Um, well, that's good. Which was, yeah. yeah. So then you, so you went to the University of Scranton. I mean, I've mm-hmm. known you for a while, so I've heard the story. But yeah. you know, our audience hasn't. You went to the University of Scranton. You escaped the University of Scranton only to go back and teach. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't consider myself a stereotypical millennial. Uh, you right. know, I'm an, I was born in 1985. So some you're, people, you're a geriatric millennial. Yeah, exactly. I say elder millennial. Some elder people will just zenial. say like zenial. Yeah. So, but I think the most stereotypical millennial thing about me was I was getting ready to graduate with my undergrad from the University of Scranton. And I thought, I'm not ready for the real world. I will go to grad school. Um, and going to grad school did a couple of things. It, it allowed me to continue to try to grow my business to see if it could be sustainable after college. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also got this my master's. Design, right? Yeah, this yeah. So this was when I was making websites, yeah, uh, which I had been doing since I was like 14. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, my so it was longer than me. Yeah, it's it's wild. Like I I learned on front page 2001. Um I started making websites for my church came to me. I'm sure you've heard this story before, but my church came to me and asked if I could make a website. I said no. They said we'll pay you and I said okay. Um <laughs> I started I was like you'll pay me. All right. Uh and then I started this was it was it was good timing because it was like again 2001 2002 a lot of small businesses realized that they started to need websites. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I found a good niche uh, with my friend's parents uh, who owned businesses as well as my friend's bands. Oh, there who, you go. That's who wanted. This was like pre MySpace. It was, yeah, it was like right before MySpace. Yeah. 2001, 2000. And, yeah. and like well before MySpace figured out that they were basically going to fully focus on music. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I, I went to grad school and I got my master's degree, which enabled me to become an adjunct professor at the university. And so you it was just good. never left. Yeah, I, I just kept going until I got married and we moved away from Scranton. Yeah, I think I met you when you were up in Scranton and then you moved somewhere else. Yeah, then, Lehigh Valley area. And you moved yeah. kind of slightly south and then you moved really far south. Yeah, I've been kind of making my way down the state. Uh, yeah, right? you're still, still in Pennsylvania. Yeah. yeah. So now I, you're, now you're yeah. west. Yes. So I'm originally from New York. Uh, New York. I, I went New York. Uh, I went to the University of Scranton, and I never left the state after that. So eventually, you then finally did escape the University of Scranton, and you, you moved away, and you were doing websites, WordPress websites. Got, you got kind of a reputation, a good reputation, but a reputation of being like the WordPress nice guy, you know, the guy <laughs> who will help out. And he's jolly, always friendly, doing work camps, teaching, 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 teaching. How did you go from doing WordPress teaching and all that good stuff to teaching courses in general, not just WordPress? Yeah, so I was told repeatedly I was a good teacher mm-hmm. by my clients, right? Because I would train them on WordPress. This was before people were really – this was before like WP101. Um, yeah. and. Uh, So I'd sit down with clients and I'd talk them through it. And they're like, oh, you're such a good teacher. I'm so bad at this. And I would always say, if everybody was good at what I did, I'd be out of a job. So Mm -hmm. I developed that empathy, I think, pretty early on in my entrepreneurial career, right? Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the teaching aspect. When I went for my master's at the U, um, I got a teaching assistantship. So I, I basically was put in charge of like one credit for uh oh, wow. for this computer course uh that was two lectures and then a lab so i was in charge of the lab and I, I loved it i would talk students through how to do specific i taught them how to use like gimp to edit yeah. images and, and things like that 
So when I graduated, I said, hey, if you ever need a, another teacher, I'm, I'm game. And it, hap- it just so happened that one of the adjunct professors was retiring. And so oh, I, wow. I took her timing. job. Yeah. Yeah. It's like life is really a lot of good timing, I think. Um, it is. It really is. It's, you know, like taking advantage of timing and, and seizing the right opportunities. But timing is a big part of it. Um, it is. It and, is. And so I enjoyed teaching when I left the University of Scranton and moved away from Scranton. I wanted to keep teaching. And I wanted to stick in that WordPress space. Then I kind of started to realize that. The WordPress space is a tough sell. <laughs> um, as much as we love it, you know, yeah, and we love the community. It's a tough sell. It's a tough sell. There's a mindset in the open source world as well, right? Like Android users, even though for a long time Android commanded seventy percent of the phone market. I think it's closer to fifty fifty now, probably. Um, At least in the United States. I think yeah. abroad is yes. still like 80, 80. Yeah. But I think I remember reading like 90% of like app sales or app income came from iOS mm-hmm. because Android's open source. And so when you go with this open source model, you expect to get a lot of things for free. Yeah. Um. So it's a tough sell. It's- the thing that solidified it for me actually was something that happened recently where uh, somebody found me via my podcast services. Oh, wow. They paid for a $500 consulting call, and we didn't even use the whole 90 minutes. We used probably like 30, and then they bought my done-for-you service. And she's like, I assume this call is just to kind of vet me to make sure I'm willing to pay your actual prices. And I'm like, yes. That's definitely how it works in other places. Just, Whereas like in the WordPress space, it's like, you're going to charge me for a call. Like, so that really solidified it for me. That exactly. Mm-hmm. I think there's a disconnect between the value um, that is, is, is being just, offered. To, to yeah. some extent, it also depends on where in the WordPress ecosystem you're, you're looking for small business. They say we can do it ourselves and they do it yeah. rather poorly. The mid level to, you know, enterprise level of wordpress i feel like they are more apt to pay but they don't, they still want the free consultation <laughs> i think you're absolutely right there and i recently wrote a blog post called how mowing the lawn is costing your podcast money or something like that it was like some oh, that's clever yeah and i basically talked about how there i let my lawn go for like three weeks and in the summer in the northeast with the rain we were getting that's like way too long Mm -hmm. so i went out there it was a weekday but it had to be done because we were going away on vacation between mowing weed whacking cleaning up the clippings and i did a little bit of hedge trimming because that was like getting out of hand too Mm -hmm. it took me about six hours i'm about halfway through it i'm thinking well let's see my billable rate is around 150 bucks an hour and so that's nine hundred dollars that this day just cost me. And but people don't think about the relationship of time and money that way. They yeah. don't. So since then, I hired somebody who comes every Tuesday morning and mows my lawn for thirty dollars. It's which is thirty dollars for something that routinely will take me an hour. Right. Like an hour every Saturday. It takes them like 10, 15 minutes. They've got the equipment they've got. And then they like do the edge up properly, too. It's like two guys. They come. They're in and out in 10 minutes. My lawn looks great and I never have to worry about it. And I am so happy to pay that. I because I never you can be down here talking on a live stream, walking people through Gutenberg, talking about podcasting and all that. So now you're teaching. Not only are you teaching WordPress stuff, still, you still have that in your catalog. But you're teaching people like me, I'm one of your students, how to podcast properly. Pat Flynn has a book called Will It Fly? And he talks mm-hmm. about what's your what's your superpower? Uh, I think my superpower, because I have my master's in software engineering, I'm a developer, but I am I am one of the rare breeds of developer who can take the the technical and mm-hmm. translate it into human speak. 
Mm. Right. And I've said for years now, I will happily take the hit on my programming skills if it means I'm more social. And so at some point, I started to do less development work and more content creation. Mm. It's been it's been like a hard fought thing. And there weren't, you know, I think that at the point I realized that there's not a lot of good resources out there for content creation was when I set up my Sony a6400, I watched a bunch of videos from photographers and videographers who are setting up this camera and telling you to set up how to set up the camera. And they completely gloss over a bunch of things that beginners wouldn't know. Ooh, because they, they're too much in the weeds. They know exactly. Already. And so I made a video that's basically uh, how to set up your Sony a6400 camera if you are not a photographer. So that video still kills it for me. That That is by far my most popular YouTube video. Uh, wow. It accounts for a lot of my affiliate income. Yeah. So I want to educate creators. I still want to do some no-code tutorials, but... Your question was, how did I, how did I not get to teaching WordPress anymore? At, at some point, I started doing less WordPress specific client work and more content creation, platform building and, and podcasting. And so I started to pivot. I did like a half pivot. I launched a course called, um, how to build your podcast website in three days and the biggest piece of feedback I got from that course was this is great, but can you show me how to set up a podcast? Yeah. And um, so I started to do that. And then it kind of through feedback and evolution and getting out of my head about like, oh, well, other people are already doing this, right? Like other people have courses on how to do that, which is so silly because I teach my students like it doesn't matter if somebody else is teaching this course. Better. Somebody else is not you teaching this course, right? Like you do yeah. it differently. And then I got into the done for you podcasting services. And so, so now I'm, I'm doing a pretty full pivot from WordPress to content creation. My online courses, uh, I don't know when this is coming out. I'm going to assume after black Friday. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so my black Friday sale is, uh, going to be the last time that anybody can buy any of my courses a la carte. And starting December 1st, it'll be only membership. Love that. That's how yeah. it should be. Yeah, that is how it should be. And, you know, like I waffled for a long time. Mm -hmm. I I tried it and then I didn't. And I was like, well, nobody wants to buy the membership. But it was just it was really more like I bought I bought the Black Friday deal. You did two you, years ago. And then, yep. then I bought the membership. because I'm like, I like yeah. Joe. Yeah. I like I, and Joe. I, I appreciate the support. Right. And you like. And that has given like you and a couple of other people who are in that membership, Lee Drozak has given me the confidence to be like, people are buying what I'm selling. I just need to get my yeah. messaging down. I need to get my funnels right. I think the hardest part of my entrepreneurial journey has been moving from selling websites to selling a membership or selling courses, because if you can get in a, if I can get in a room with somebody, I can convince them to spend Absolutely. three, five, ten thousand dollars on a website. Mm -hmm. I know your problem. I understand it. I've been doing this for years. But to write copy, to target the segments and micro segments that you're trying to talk to is a lot harder for me. And so I always tell people I have a lot easier time selling one five thousand dollar website than one hundred fifty dollar courses. It's uh, so weird, but it's so true. Yeah, but I'm getting better. I'm learning a lot. I consume a ton of stuff. I spoke to John Warlow, uh, yeah. author of Built to Sell, on my podcast recently as we record this, and he's really the one who convinced me. Not He wasn't like, you need to switch to membership, but after our conversation, I was like, I need to switch to, to membership only. Membership, and he, because yeah. he was like, he's like, you can't do half and half, because if you do half and half, it shows people you're not all in. If you give them a one-time payment, they're going to take it. But if you take away that one-time payment and you only give them the option to subscription, you're saying, I'm all in on this. This is how I can offer you the best product. Mm -hmm. This is how I can offer you the best membership. So this is what you should do if you want to keep learning from me. Black Friday sale and then memberships Oosh. only. Yeah, exactly. I love that. So what's the best, and your answer with the hard thing about entrepreneurship is, what's the best thing about being an entrepreneur? The pandemic is what solidified this answer for me. 
Okay, it's well, not the it's pandemic. The pandemic's the best thing. I'm like, yeah, what? The pandemic's the best. You can you can cut that clip, and that could be your cold open. What's the best yeah. thing about being an entrepreneur? The pandemic. The pandemic. Um, <laughs> the pandemic really solidified this for me because I left my job at Crowd Favorite a little over four years ago. It's because I felt like we were working long hours, and I I felt like I was going to miss time with my family. And so people start businesses for one of two reasons, pretty much, right? To make millions, right? That hustle mm-hmm. culture that I'm going to I'm gonna work really hard and make a ton of money and it'll be great. Mm-hmm. Or to run a lifestyle business. And I'm, I'm choosing the latter because mm-hmm. um, I want to spend time with my family. I've got two kids. I've got another one on the way. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I guess I don't care to sleep. So the best part about being an entrepreneur for me is the flexibility I have to be there for my family because my wife's a nurse. So it's not like we were both home during the pandemic. She was going to the hospital and they're short staffed. So she was working long hours. So I could take those days off and watch the Mm -hmm. kids. And it was hard. um, And it was hard, but it's fun. And I tried to... In some way, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. I tried to remind myself during the harder times that (laughs) <laughs> uh, I'm getting a lot of bonus time with my kids because Teresa would have been in preschool or daycare. Um, mm-hmm. You're mini me. Yeah. Yeah. She really is. She has to always be right. And so do I. Uh, oh, that's funny. Oh, that's <laughs> this is, they say, they say kids are grandparents revenge and it's a hundred percent true. Uh, she's, uh, she's a chip off the old block. She really is. Um, but, uh, and so, the the ability to be flexible, even though it caused a little bit of stress when I got a lot, I got in the weeds with my work. Yeah. The fact that we weren't like totally put out during the pandemic um, and we didn't have to send our kids somewhere that put us all at risk. Exactly. Um, is really drove home the point of why I started a business. Exactly. So, Joe, where can people find you? Where's the best place to connect with Joe? I if, think I know the answer, but yeah. Yeah, there's too many places. Um, Casabona.org is where is like my content funnel. Uh, mm-hmm. So I put out four to five pieces of content a week. You can, I, I know it's a lot, but it's, it's fine. I like it. Um, it's my favorite part of the day. I've put off actual like client work because I felt like doing YouTube videos or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's my goal for 2022 though, right? Is, is anyway. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Casabona.org is where you can find me. Now, mm-hmm. we've talked a lot about the memberships and the courses, yes, right? So where can they get that? Go to Casabona.org slash Enigma. Okay. And you will get redirected to that website. Perfect. With a 33% off coupon Ooh. for the membership, which love will it. last as long as you are a member, right? It won't just be the first year. It'll be 33% Ooh, off as long as you're a member. So Love it. Um, Thank you, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, Joe, this has been fun. Awesome. Great. I love it. I love it. Love it. it. Thank you for being on the show and everyone. We'll see you next week. That was a great show. Hey, if you're enjoying entrepreneurs enigma, please give us a review on the podcast directory of your choice. We're on all of them. And these reviews really help others find the show. Also, if you're getting value from the show and want to buy me a coffee, go to the show notes and click on the link to help me stay awake while I bring you more great episodes to your ears. That's in the show notes, and I look forward to the next episode. Take care, guys. hopes you have enjoyed this episode. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Christopher Hines hosts a great podcast called Pod Central. Chris, tell us what these fine folks will get when they listen. We help you launch, grow, or monetize your podcast. We even help those podcast business owners out there grow their agencies and get more clients. This is a place where you come to learn everything podcasting. Wow. Where can people subscribe? Search for the podcast wherever you listen to your shows or find me on Twitter at Chris Podcasting and I 
can send it to you directly. Or go to marketingpodcasts.net. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.